fathers and all. All right, so we're gonna we're studying the book of John. Last week we did the introduction. This week we're gonna be beginning John chapter one. If you want to turn with me, we're gonna go ahead and read John chapter one, um, verses one through five, and then we're gonna go to the Lord in prayer. Starting at verse 1, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And more than one scholar that I read behind stated that A better translation probably would have been that the darkness apprehended it not. And we'll break it down when we get to that verse. Right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you and praise you, Lord. We give you glory and honor. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. You are the illuminator of the the, the precious Word of God. It is you who can open our eyes that we can see, Lord, and open our ears that we can hear, Lord. We pray that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, to receive the seed of your Word because your Word is precious, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to be better servants for you, Lord. That is the desire of everyone in this room or else they wouldn't be here on a Tuesday night. I pray a special blessing over each and every one of them, Lord. I pray that you would speak through me, Lord. No man or woman needs to hear the words of Matt. Lord God, what we need to hear is your words, Lord. So I pray. Lord, I've studied. I've studied hard, Lord God, but I pray that you would speak, oh Lord God, and we just pray that you would show up in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, well, there's there's some main ideas that I'm just going to go ahead and write on the board so that you can be, be looking. Um, within these five verses of Scripture, I saw at least five different concepts, theological concepts, if you will, that I thought were very important. In, in verses 1 through 5, um, in the beginning... This, this clause, well really a, a prepositional phrase, is linking us directly back to creation. So that's the first observation that I made. Like I said, we're gonna, there, there's some really deep theological principles in here. In the beginning, next pre- part of the statement, in the beginning was the Word. And what we're going to see as we begin to break down the concept of the Word and who the Word was, many of us already know because we've read the book of John many times, is that the Word actually was Jesus and what this is describing is the deity of Christ. What does that mean? What does the word deity mean? It means Jesus was God. Amen? And why is that even important to know? I thought everybody everybody knows Jesus is God. Well, no, there's a lot of people that don't think Jesus was God. The Jehovah's Witness don't think Jesus is God. The Muslims don't think Jesus was God. Okay, so there's a lot of people that don't think Jesus is God, but that's not what the Word of God says, and that's not what John said. Amen? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Well, that says a couple of things. Number one, it, it describes, and I'm not going to write this, but it describes the eternal, existent nature of God. That means Jesus was God. He's always been God. He's been there from the beginning with God. But this also describes the concept of the Trinity. We serve a triune God. He is one God, amen, but He is, he is made up of three distinct personalities, if you will, three distinct Uh, Yes, three distinct personalities, and He works in our life in three distinct ways. Amen? And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. The Bible says, next it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. What we're going to see there is, Jesus' part in creation. And then all these things I just wanted to point out, okay, are pre incarnation. What does that mean? 
All these things took place. Jesus did all this. This is all speaking of Jesus. But all this took place before He became flesh in His uh, position as God. Amen? Before He took on this earthly garment, if you will. Okay? And so the last thing that I wanted to point out, number five, is that Jesus brought light and life. What I saw in that particular verse was that Jesus is the connection or Jesus connects, Jesus is the bridge between God and man. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is in the beginning. We see in the first, let's go ahead and turn, this is taking us directly back to the book of Genesis. The first, the very beginning of the book of Genesis. And if you turn, if you have your Bibles and you turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, we're going to just make a couple of observations. And I'm probably, I am going to probably have to move along at a, sooner or later at a pretty good clip because I think I have a lot of information here. I don't really want to do a whole lot of reading right here. I just wanted to make a couple of observations and point out a few things. Uh, starting in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I wanted you to take notice at verse 3. It says, And God said... Look at verse 6. And God said... Look at verse 9. And God said. Look at verse 11. And God said. Look at verse 14. And God said. Okay. And look, 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 look back at um, verse uh, 7. And it was so. Look at verse 9 at the end of verse 9. And it was so. And look at the end of verse 11. And it was so. I just wanted to point out to you that in creation, God, that what we see is, is that God's Word created. Amen. God spoke and it was so. Now, what I need you to understand about whenever we call Jesus the Word, we should not have this picture in our mind that the Father speaking in the words that are proceeding out of His mouth are Jesus. Amen. No, Jesus is known as the eternal Word. Amen. That's His position. Turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Two, if you will, quickly. I want you to see some things about Jesus. Maybe many of you already knew this, but I have to be honest with you. I was a Christian for 12 years before I really began to dig it out in the Word. And I don't know if it's because people didn't teach about it very much. But uh, the book of Philippians. Yeah, go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. All right. All right, the book of uh, Philippians, chapter 2, verse 6. This is really a teaching on humility that Paul is trying to teach the Philippian church. But we're just going to focus in on that one scripture mostly. Uh, and, and Philippians, chapter 2, verse 6. And it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. What does that mean? He says that he was in the form of God and at the same time he did not consider it robbery to be considered equal with God. Other translations describe it like this, that Jesus was in the form of God and he did not consider it something to be grasped to at all costs. Like in other words, Jesus willingly let go of his position of deity, amen, so that he could be a, become a servant of God and become a man. Okay? So the main point that really I'm trying to make through all this, huh? Pre existence. The fact that Jesus was there in the beginning, amen, and that he was God. And, and it's important for us to know that, okay? But now we're going to take a look at Jesus' uh, part in creation. If you uh, turn to me to the book of Colossians, turn with me to the book of Colossians. One page over. There you go. <laughs> Colossians chapter 1 
verse 16 and 17. It says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Verse 17, And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. When we compare Colossians 1, 16 and 17 to what we just read in John chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. We see real clearly that the Bible has explained to us that Jesus Created, Amen. All things were created by Him and for Him. Now I want you to take a look with me at Revelation chapter, the book of Revelation chapter 4. For sake of time, I just want to kind of set it up for you. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4 that there was a door open in heaven and John the Beloved, the very one that we're, right, we're, going to, we're studying the gospel that he wrote, also wrote the book of Revelation. And he said there was a door open in heaven and he was caught up into heaven and he had a vision of things to come. And the Bible says that uh, there was one who was seated on the throne. Now I need you to understand that if you read this through along with chapter 4 and 5 and you're going to have to take my word for it and go back and study it for yourself which I encourage you to do but if you do study chapter 4 and 5 you're going to find out that the one seated on the throne has to be God the Father. He's the one that has the book in his hand. The book is sealed. No one is worthy to open the book. As a matter of fact it causes such a ruckus in heaven that John the Beloved begins to cry because no one's worthy to open the book. But the good news is is that the angel comes to him and says why do you cry? You see, because He is worthy. See, the line of the tribe of Judah has prevailed and He is worthy. Amen. But when John saw Him, he said, I looked and beheld a lamb. As, I mean a lion as though it had been slain. Amen. So, so the angel talks about the fact that, th- that the lion overcame but the lamb had been slain. Amen. So that's how he overcame. But that, that really wasn't what I was trying to get into. But what I wanted you to see was is that the one seated on the throne had the book but no one was worthy to open the book. But that the lamb was worthy and he took the book. And so what we're talking about here is God the Father and God the Son. But look what it says about God the Father, the one who was seated on the throne at the end of chapter 4. It says, The four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne and they worship Him that lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for Thou hast created all things and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So what I wanted you to see there is that the Bible is clear in letting us know that Jesus created At the same time, the Bible is clear in letting us know that the Father created. Now if you'll turn with me to Job chapter 26, verse 13. Twenty-six, thirteen. The book of Job is right before the Psalms. Job 26.13 The Bible says, By His Spirit He has garnished the heavens, His hand has formed the crooked serpent. What was my point? My point is is that the Bible, in three different places, has told us that Jesus created, that the Father created, and that the Spirit created. The Spirit of God garnished the heavens. So my question for you tonight is, is this a discrepancy? Is the Bible telling us something that's improper? How can... All three create. I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of things going on in the world today. You know what I'm saying? There's chaos around every corner. Everywhere you turn, things are being shaken. People are uncertain about their futures. People are uncertain about their jobs. People are uncertain about the direction that they're headed and that their family's headed. But one thing I can tell you is that um, this is a firm foundation on which you can stand. Amen? This is not shifting sand. Amen? The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that the flower will fade and the grass will wither, but that the word of the Lord will 
will endure forever. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that it's not a discrepancy. I'm here to tell you that, that God the Father created, God Jesus the Word, amen, created, and God the Holy Spirit also created. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. But what I wanted you to know is, is that God has a plan. Amen. God has a plan. Look, turn with me to 1 Peter 1.18. That's towards the end, after the book of Hebrews, after James. 1 Peter 1.18. We've quoted this scripture many times in the Bible study. Let's read it again. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The point that I even... Why did I even go to that scripture? Why, If we're talking about creation in the midst of all this, why is it that we would turn to 1 Peter 1.18? Because I, got, I need you to understand something, that God has a plan. I need you to understand that while everybody else is biting their fingers and they're freaking out because they don't know what's going on, God has a plan. We're moving along the timeline that God has set in order. It's okay. We're His children. We're in covenant with Him. But what I wanted you to understand is, is that God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? God created an earth for you to dwell on. I need you to understand understand something tonight. I want you to understand. I know that the Lord put this in my spirit to tell you tonight that you are special to God. If nobody's ever told you before how special you are, God sent me to tell you tonight that He loves you and that you're special to Him. He, you are so special to Him that He created the earth for you to dwell on. He created the vegetation to sustain you. He created the animals to give you pleasure. God created the earth for you to dwell on. But before He ever created that earth... And before he ever created his prized possession, his prized creation, because he had a purpose for that creation, before he ever did any of that creation, at least regarding the earth and you and I, he knew he had a plan. Because you see, he already knew what was going to happen. You see, in God's omniscience, he knew that there was going to be a fall. He knew that an infection was going to take place. He knew that one of his creations, Satan, Lucifer, the angel of light, was going to say, I'm going to rise above the throne of God. I'm going to exalt myself above God's throne. Amen. That pride was going to enter his heart and that that infection was going to spread to a third of the angels and that a third of the angels were going to fall with him and that a kingdom of darkness was going to be in place. He knew that. And I've talked to countless people over and over again and they're like, How, why would you serve a God who said, everybody tells me He's a God of love, yet at the same time He's sending millions of people to the devil's hell. And I'm like, no, God's not sending anybody to hell. God sent a lamb. God sent a lamb. God sent a sacrifice to make a way. Amen? But the truth of the matter is, is that so, okay, and, and, and this was part of the conversation with those two nursing students. If you're just joining us, I told a story about two nursing students that I had spoken to about the Lord. And one of these nursing students said, so let me ask you this, dude. Come on, think about it, man. God can't be real. I mean, if God was real and He really knew what everybody says He knows, He would have never created that angel to begin with because He would have known that it was going to cause all this trouble. I said, no. See, that's where you're wrong. Because you see, God created a creation that He wanted to reciprocate love to Him. What does that mean? He wanted a creation that would willingly give it back. He wanted a creation that was going to choose to live for Him. Let me ask anybody in this room tonight, would you be interested in spending the rest of your life with a person who was forced into a relationship with you? No, no of course not. You think God wants to be, spend eternity with a bride that was forced into a relationship with you? Let, let me ask you a question. If all you know is God, is there really a choice? See, that's the question I have. If all you know is God, if all that exists is God in His goodness, is there really a choice to be made? No, there's not. But yet the, we know that God created you and I with a free will. 
God created you and I with a free will to make a choice. To, to question whether or not we were going to choose to go God's way or choose to go our way. But until there's a choice to be made, there's really no choice at all. If it would not be for this fallen angel called Lucifer, there would be no choice. But there is a choice today. See, there's a choice today for a person to live for themselves, to gratify their flesh, their physical body, right? To take substances into their body that will numb the pain of their mind, numb the pain of their past, gratify their flesh through the various things that make themselves feel good, whatever that may be. Or there is a choice to go God's way. To live not necessarily for today and for self, but to live for knowing something that greater in the future. To live for God's will, amen. To know, to live a life of selflessness rather than selfishness. To know that God has a calling. To know that God has people out there that are in pain and all they know is to try to take those substances in that numb their pain. And in reality, He came to bring light. He came to bring love, but if none of us who, like I was telling those two nursing students, if all of the, if the disciples were like 85% of the, of the people that claim to be Christian today, Christianity would have died 2,000 years ago. Because most of us as Christians, okay, aren't willing to open our mouths, aren't willing to go the extra mile, aren't willing to be there for the hurting of the world. I'm preaching to myself. Do I do enough? I, none of us do. But the point is, is how many Christians think they're in the ball game and they're not even in the ball game? You see what I'm saying? Because so many people's motives and their and the reason that they make decisions are really more about self than they are about the Lord. How many people actually invite Jesus into their everyday life? How many people actually invite Jesus into their everyday decision making process? I, I'm just asking the question. And and so. The whole thing that I began to talk about to this young man was, is that is there really a choice if there is no choice? And so God knew before He ever created what was going to happen. God knew that this angel was going to fall. God knew that this process was going to cause an infection that was going to draw people away and that there was going to be a choice to be made. Amen? That's right. You still have made a choice. You've chosen to go your own way or go the devil's way or go the opposite way, if you will. But God had a plan. Amen? And what I wanted you to see back to the concept of creation is that the Father has a plan. Amen? The Father has a plan of creation. And that the Word spoke the plan. And what we read in the beginning, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? And the earth was without form and void. And the Spirit, some translations say, hovered or moved upon the face of the deep. That word in the Hebrew, moved, I, I didn't study it recently, but I remember from a long time ago, describes a, a mother hen brooding upon her eggs, preparing, waiting to do its function. The Holy Spirit was preparing and waiting, brooding upon the face of the earth, waiting for its opportunity, waiting to do what it was meant to do to give birth, to cause life to come forth. And so the Father had a plan for creation, and the Word spoke that plan into existence. And when it did... When the Word spoke, the Spirit created. Now the reason that I went through that is because I thought, you know, we need to describe and we need to explain why there's different scriptures in the Bible that some say that Jesus created, some say the Father created, some say the Holy Spirit created, and yes, they all did create. But I need you to also understand that in the same concept, God also had a plan for salvation. Because you see, whenever he, he created the heavens and the earth like we described, and He created the earth as a place for you to dwell because you're that special to Him. Because He desired to have communion with you. He desired to have relationship with you. There was no other reason for God to create humanity. And He created a, a, a creation that He wanted to once again reciprocate that love to Him. Amen? But he, so here's Adam and Eve. And he places him in the garden. And what did he tell Adam? Tend and keep. Amen. He gave him, he gave him things to do. He gave him the opportunity to dwell. But the Bible also says that in the cool of the day, God walked with Adam. 
God had relationship with Adam. God communed with Adam. He walked with him. He talked with him. Amen? But even in the midst of all that, guess what there was? A choice. There was a choice in the garden. There was a choice in the beginning. There was a choice to choose God's way or to choose another way. Really, the devil's way. Self's way. To go my own way. Whatever I think is best for me. And what I wanted you to see here is, is that just as, the God, as, as God had a plan for creation, God also has a plan for salvation. And the Father had a plan. And the Father's plan said that you are not redeemed by corruptible things. The word redeemed means to be bought out of the slave market. To be purchased. See, it costs something. See, we talk about the fact that salvation is free. And I have to tell you, salvation is free to you and me, amen. But it costs Jesus His life. It costs Jesus His blood. You were not redeemed. You weren't bought off the slave market with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but by the precious blood of a lamb who was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. So the Father had a plan for salvation. And the Word became flesh, amen, and spoke that plan. He communicated that plan of the Father, and then He became the sacrifice to enact that plan, amen? So the Father had a plan, the Word spoke the plan and enacted the plan, and just as the Spirit hovered over the face of the deep, the Holy Spirit, who lives in you, and who lives in me, and He follows us everywhere we go, Amen. That same Holy Spirit is waiting to hover over the hearts of men and women. You see, because now as the written word, the written word that is teaching us and educating us and explaining to us the concepts of the eternal word, which was the plan from the beginning, amen, of the Father to save humanity. Now when the written word, which tells us of the eternal word, is spoken in public places... Because it's spoken every day. It's spoken at the places where we work. It's spoken at the places where we go to school. It's spoken offshore. Amen. It's spoken in homes. And whenever the word of the written, the written word is spoken about the eternal word, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the hearts of men. When's the last time, I mean this isn't a word of condemnation, it's a word of challenge. When's the last time you spoke about the written word? When's the last time you told somebody the story about the eternal word? <clears throat> Amen? Because see, what the Holy Spirit needs you and I to do is to get in the place that He created us for, to get into a place that He purposed us for so that we can function and do our job, which is to speak the written word that tells about the eternal word so the Holy Spirit can hover and move over the heart of man. Waiting for that word to be spoken. Waiting for that heart to engage that truth by faith. Amen? And when that truth is engaged by faith, what happens? Creation takes place. Man is recreated. Because you see, he's fallen into a place of disarray. He's fallen into a place of despair. The infection has caused him to walk in darkness and separated him from the holiness of God. And so, I just wanted you to see that tonight, that... Not only did God the Father have a plan for creation, but He also had a plan for salvation. And you know what? While we're on it, let's just remember, this is, I think this is important for us to talk about. And you know what? If, if this is things that you know, we've talked about many times before, just bear with me. But not only does the Father have a plan for creation, not only does the Father have a plan for salvation, but the Father has a plan for sanctification. See, the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 8... Romans chapter 8 I meant to write the verse down earlier but you can find it I think it's verse 18 probably it's Romans 8 29 I'm sorry the Bible teaches us that we are to be conformed into the image of Christ the word conformed means to be fashioned like unto. So what does that mean? That means that you are being fashioned. You are being molded. You are being acted upon. You're the clay. He's the potter. You're on the wheel. He's molding you. 
He's shaping you. Amen? So just as the Father had a plan for creation and just as He had a plan for salvation, He also has a plan for sanctification. It's important that you and I understand that. That the Father's plan requires that you and I understand that plan and put our faith in that plan. Because you see... The plan requires that you and I, our nature through that process of, of salvation was changed. Many, we've already talked about that many times. We've talked about the fact that we were born originally with a sinful nature and that when we were born again we received the divine nature. We talked about the fact that our address changed. Our position changed. Remember that? Before we were out here in the world walking in darkness, clueless about the things of God. But then somebody told me the good news. Amen. He told me about, he told me about the written word that spoke of the eternal word and my, I put my faith in what he was saying because when he actually when she said it when my sister told me that my life was a mess and that the only way to get it right was to put my hope in Jesus I put my faith in that and when I did I was translated I was translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and so now in that position that's the plan of the Father now I'm in Christ but let me tell you something I have to remain in Christ I have to remember that it's in, through my relationship and my faith in God's plan that allows me to be in covenant with God. You understand that God works on covenant agreement? We've already talked about that. In God's covenant, the Holy Spirit moves in my life when my faith is right. So why am I even saying all this? Because once again, the Father has a plan. Amen. Jesus enacted the plan. The Holy Spirit is actually the one who is the hands of the Father. Amen. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that if you need change in your life today, do you know who's going to do it? Do you know who's going to change you today? Do you know who's going to form you and fashion you and make you look more like Jesus? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit working in your life. It's the Holy Spirit whenever you're walking throughout your day and there's things in your life that you're struggling with that's going to deal with your heart about it. It's the Holy Spirit that's actually going to do the supernatural work in your life to take the desire away. Amen. See, you can't do it on your own. You need to understand that. If you don't get anything else out of this Bible study, if you're still here in a year, you need to get this. You can't do it on your own. This isn't a self-help program, man. It, this is a Holy Spirit help program. I need some help down here. Amen? And the Holy Spirit helps based off of my position in Christ and me saying, I can't do it, Lord, but I believe you already did it. I believe what you did at Calvary purchased access for me to the presence of God. I believe what you did at Calvary purchased access for me. I'm now giving permission to the Holy Spirit to work in my life. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to change you. Is what I'm trying to tell you. This is the plan of sanctification. Amen? Amen. So that's, that's creation. Uh, we didn't talk about the science of creation. That's in Genesis chapter, chapter 1 and 2. We didn't. We talked a little bit, of, we talked about more so the theology of creation. Really more so we talked about the, the, the function of Jesus in creation. Amen. And so, so far, what we talked about was was the, was creation, and also I wanted to um, now the next concept is it says in the beginning, which was creation, was the Word, and we talked about the fact that this describes the deity of Christ, and we've already pretty much established that for the most part that He existed from the beginning. And whenever we talk a little bit about the Word here in a second, what the concept of Word means, we're going to get into it a little bit deeper. But I did want to just describe to you a little bit about Trinity. Now I'm not going to sit here and and try to to explain to you something that scholars themselves have trouble understanding. Uh, you know, I'm go- I'm going to try to explain to you, but what I'm trying to get at is, is that there's some things that you and I are going to have to accept by faith. There's some things that are very difficult for us to wrap our mind completely around. Some people would say, well, then you know what? If I can't taste it, if I can't see it, if I can't smell it, if I can't feel it, then I ain't going to believe it. Well, then guess what? You're going your own way. You're not going God's way. You're making a choice because God built His economy. God built His kingdom upon faith. It requires faith to follow after God. Amen. But but I want you to understand something. I'm going to tell you about this concept called an egg, okay? Now, the Trinity is not an egg, all right? But I've thought about this a lot, and I think that it kind of somewhat explains what I'm trying to explain to you, is that an egg is one entity, right? There's one egg. But yet it's got three separate and distinct parts. Does it not? It does. It has a shell, 
And what does the shell do? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but it protects it. That's what I would think. The shell provides protection. And the white, I know it's for you and I to eat, but I would think whenever we're talking about the chick, it probably provides nourishment, right? But what is the yolk? The yolk is the life. Right? And so the point that I wanted to make is, is that God is one. He's one in essence. He's one in nature. He's one in purpose. He has one purpose. In the time frame that we're in right now, in the church age, the purpose is winning the souls of men. That, that, that's the purpose. See, because humanity was created to live for God. The fall caused separation between man and God. The, the church age that we're in is the propagation of the gospel so that man can come back to God. Amen? And when man comes back to God, then guess what? We're going to enter a new time frame. When it's going to be, it should be right now, all about the adoration of God to begin with. Because He's worthy to be worshipped. Amen? He alone is worthy to be worshipped. But man in the state that he's in can't even see how worthy God is. Amen? But when God wraps this thing up, alright, and this mortal puts on immortality, and this corruptible puts on incorruptible, then we're going to be able to see Him for who He truly is. Amen? And He's going to be able to be worshipped for how He truly deserves. So we talked about creation. We talked about the deity of Christ. Amen? And now let's see here. We're, now we're going to talk about the concept of the Word. So what does the Word mean? I have to tell you that I don't think that all of the book of John is going to be this um, technical. <laughs> But, nevertheless, this is where we are in the book of John. Well, whenever we talked last time about com the communication of the Bible, we talked about the fact that there were a lot of things that had to go into that. We talked about the fact that, we, that the original author had an original meaning for the original audience, correct? And so... Whenever we look at the, the concept of the Word, we have to take into account what was actually being communicated here. See, the author is John, and he was Jewish. And the audience, once again, were the churches of Asia Minor, which were prevalently Gentile. So, basically, for the most part, you have to understand that there's two schools of thought going on here. There's a Jewish concept of what word means, and there's also a Greek concept of what word means. But John came along and transcended all of that and gave the true meaning of what word means. And we're going to break it down in a second and get into it, okay? But first of all, for uh, I wanted to bring this point out too, though, is that you know, you and I have the luxury of having the Old Testament Scriptures, the New Testament Scriptures, the church age has been in existence for 2,000 years. We've had the church fathers that have written concepts of theology. We've had Martin Luther who brought around Reformation theology. And now you and I, there's so many things that we just take for granted and already know. But you have to understand something, that if, if the Gospel of John was written in A.D. 95, that means the church was only in existence for about 60 years. And, and you got, there was no Fox News. <laughs> there was no email. There was no Twitter. Okay, and what I'm trying to say is, is that the word spread somewhat slowly. And so, if now I'm not now what I do, will say is that these churches were already established. In other words, they already knew the Lord. But that doesn't mean that they understood all the aspects of the background about Jesus and about his Jewish ancestry and about his culture to understand who Jesus really was. And so, when John is writing the book of John, he, it's almost as though he's in introducing Jesus in a more in-depth way to these churches so that they can understand Him. So He's in introducing Jesus to us here. But the, but the Jewish idea of Word, I thought this was real interesting. Well, we'll get back to that Word in a second. But let's look at, um, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Job chapter 28.
Job 28, and we'll start at verse 12, and, and we'll, we'll read some of this information. But, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knows not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. The depth says it is not in me, and the sea says it is not in, with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver. We're talking about wisdom here. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it. I'm going to go ahead and skip down. Whence then comes wisdom? Verse 20. And where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say, We have heard the fame thereof with our ears. God understands the way thereof and He knows the place thereof. We're in Job 28. We're talking about wisdom. Verse 24. For He looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heaven to make the weight for the winds. And He weighs the waters by measure. When He made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of thunder, then did He see it and declared. He prepared it, yeah, and searched it out. And unto man He said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. If you'll turn with me to... The book of Proverbs chapter 8 real quick. I wanted to show you. In, in Jewish literature, you remember, we, we've talked about the fact that the Gospel of John is actually considered narrative literature. And the book of Job and the book of Proverbs were considered wisdom literature, just in case you were curious. Wisdom literature. Oh, Proverbs 8. First, first thing I wanted you to see about wisdom in this particular scripture, and we've talked about this before in the past, is that wisdom in this particular scripture is personified. You may, now, I mean, some people may say, man, why, why are you saying all this stuff? Well, we've already discussed what personification means in the Bible study. Because you remember when we studied the book of Romans chapter 7, or Romans chapter 5, when it said sin has reigned as it... Sin has reigned. We talked about the fact that the Bible writer was describing sin as a king that reigns on the heart of man. Personification simply is attributing human-like qualities to inanimate objects. Okay. So what we're talking about in Proverbs 8 is that sin, not sin, I'm sorry, wisdom is given human-like characteristics. Okay. It says, Does not wisdom cry out, and understanding put forth her voice? She stands in the top of high places, by the way in the places of paths. She cries at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in at the doors, unto you, O men, I call. And my voice is to the sons of men. O you simple, understand wisdom. And you fools, be you of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak. Speak truth and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. I don't know about you, but it sounds like Jesus. It sounds like Jesus standing and preaching the gospel and telling people, I am the Messiah. I, ha I am truth. I am the understanding of God. Amen? All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. But then he goes on and, and he says... Uh, verse 22 of chapter 8. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way before His works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. That doesn't mean, he was, that doesn't mean wisdom was created. It says that when the time was right, He was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was... I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundation of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. The point that I wanted to make to you is that in Old Testament literature, wisdom, okay, I never did give you the definition for the for for the, the Greek definition for word. It is something said along with the thought. Is 
it describes doctrine, thought, reason. It can also be thought of as a message. So essentially the word can describe me and you actually speaking, you and me actually preaching, but it, more deeply it means the concepts of which we're talking about, the concepts of which we're preaching about, the thoughts that we're discussing. Okay. But what I wanted you to see is that in the Jewish Old Testament, wisdom, thought, reason, the message of God, doctrine. Wisdom is crying out in the streets. And wisdom is saying, Come unto me, you who are simple, you who need understanding. Come unto me, hear the words of my mouth, I speak truth. What you need to know about me is that me, wisdom, I dwelled with God in the beginning. I was there at His side. I was a craftsman at His side. And as He told the ocean to go no, no further, I was there with Him as a craftsman by His side, assisting Him in the process of creation. So in the Jewish mindset, wisdom became personified. The interesting thing that I wrote this word uh, memra up here. This was something that I never knew before that I learned in my studies. That after the Babylonian captivity, okay, what does that mean? Come on, man, really? <laughs> You're going to really break it down that deep? Come on. <laughs> what is the Babylonian captivity? Okay. You remember all the, you remember all the prophets? That, that came and warned Israel and said you got in the Old Testament you got to get rid of the idols you got to quit playing the harlot with the idols you got to quit worshiping Baal God's about to bring your enemy from the north the Babylonians down upon you and he's going to take you into captivity you got to quit running with the world in today's vernacular you got to quit running with the devil like David Lee Roth would tell you okay well actually he would tell you to run with the devil but you get the point is that is that God sent prophets to warn his children that they were playing the harlot with the gods of other nations and if they didn't get right, something was fixing to come down on them and they didn't get right and judgment came and their enemy from the north, which was the nation of Babylon, came down and brought them into captivity. And they stayed in captivity for 70 years. The Bible talks about the fact that they hung their harps upon the terebinth trees. They had no more song. The enemy had stolen their song. But yet the enemy said, why don't you play for us now? I heard a preacher preach a good message one time. What do you do when the enemy steals your song, right? But the point is, is that that was the Babylonian captivity. For 70 years, they stayed there. After the Babylonian captivity, there were Jewish rabbis that began to write a lot of commentaries. And within those commentaries, this word memra, which means word, Memra equals word in the Aramaic language, which is very similar to Hebrew. Okay? Actually, Aramaic was before Hebrew. And the idea of Memra was that these rabbis began to say that in addition to the fact that wisdom is personified, that the word Memra began to present itself, or it had presented itself in the Old Testament. So all of the theophanies, I'm using a lot of big words, but you know what, this is good. We need to learn some stuff, amen? It's the Bible. We're learning about the Bible. Theophanies. Have you ever heard that word? What does that word mean? That means whenever God manifested Himself in the Old Testament. That means whenever the angels showed up at Abraham's tent and said, I'm about to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a theophany. The, 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 the rabbis after the Babylonian captivity said that was a memra. Every time God's presence showed up, it was a memory. That was the Word showing up. Amen? And, and, and exacting God's plan at that point in time. In other words, I see a fourth in the furnace, and he looks like the Son of Man. That was a memory. The, the presence of God showed up in the midst of that situation. The Word showed up. Amen. In, the, in, in Daniel in the lion's den, when the angel shut the mouth, of the, that was memory. The Word, the presence of the Word of God showed up in that situation. Memory was with Joseph in the prison. Sustaining him, amen. Memra is the pre is, it means word in Aramaic, but it, it took on a new meaning after the Babylonian captivity, and that the word was was present with God's people. 
Okay, so that's the Aramaic idea of the word word. Now, when we talk about logos, that's the Greek. That's actually the word... That, see, because the little bit that I learned in the past about what logos meant, I was always told it was the written word and that rhema was the spoken word. And that's not, I didn't see anything like that in all my studies. So I just thought I'd point it out. This may be too much information, but anyway... So Logos is actually the word in the Bible that you read on, in John chapter 1 when it says in the beginning was the word. Okay? That's why, that's why we're saying all this stuff. In the beginning was the word. Okay, I'm sorry if I lost anybody. I know I'm going fast and I'm, I know it's a lot of stuff. But you know what? Listen to the CD a few times and you know what? Hey, you gonna, you'll, you'll, you'll learn some things. Praise God. Alright, so Logos is the Greek word for word. Now the Greek idea for word, now there was a Greek philosopher, okay? And now that, believe me, I'm giving you the shortened version. <laughs> you don't want to know all the information I read, okay? 500 BC, there was a Greek philosopher named Heracletus. And what he said was that the word the Logos was an ordering principle that holds the universe together. Okay? So there was this supernatural presence that was out there somewhere that was a, that was a word. It was the concept of reason. It was thought. It was instruction. And it was actually what was holding everything together. Okay? I know that sounds kind of crazy, but then John comes along and he says, in the beginning was the Word. You see, you're right. <laughs> Memra was with the three Hebrew boys in the furnace. The Word did show up. Amen. The Word was in the pit with Daniel when the lions were about to rip him to pieces. Amen. The Word did show up and speak a word to Abraham. Amen. And to you Greek people that are in the churches of Asia Minor, i got to let you know something. The Word is the ordering principle that holds the universe together. As a matter of fact, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, Actually, we'll start in verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 2 and 3. Actually, let's start in verse 1 so we can have a complete thought. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. There's another scripture that talks about Jesus' part in creation. Okay? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 now. Who being the brightness of, God, of His glory and the express image of His person, this is the part I wanted you to see. Verse 3. And upholding all things by the word of His power. When He had Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the, of the Majesty on high. Well, what I wanted you to see is, look at this. He upholds all things by the word of His power. So this word is capitalized. Amen. Because that's what John was trying to tell these people. Is, is that the word that I'm speaking of is not just a presence that shows up, okay? The word that I'm speaking of is not just some untouchable essence that's out there that's holding the universe together, but in reality, the word is a man. Yes. And his man, his name is Jesus. Amen. And so he is the word. And he's the word that holds things together. Amen. And that's a, that's a good word. Because, you know, we talked about earlier the fact that the world is falling apart. Amen? Or it appears to be falling apart. But see, from our perspective, we understand and know that God has not been caught by surprise. See, before He ever even created you and I, before He ever created this earth for you and I to dwell on, He already had the plan in place. 
So he's not up there biting his fingernails. He's not up there nervous. And you know what? It's easy for us to say that, but let us remember that the God we serve is really in control. Amen? And for us to be able to trust in that. Holy Spirit, we ask that you give us the grace that we need to be able to trust in that when things don't go our way. Amen? Whenever we're blindsided with things that we don't expect. Lord, help us to be able to trust in that. Amen? Alright. So that was the concept of the Word. I told someone yesterday, you have my word, my boss. Uh-huh. That, means that, that means you have what I say I'm going to do. You're going to do it. Amen. Amen. You gave him your word. <laughs> your word. And amen. When your word's backed up by the word, then it's a word worth hearing. <laughs> but if your word ain't backed up by the word, brother, I don't want to hear it because it ain't going to last. <laughs> Come on, brother. I'm saying your word is backed up by the word. All right. So, yeah, you're right. They take it for granted. They take it lightly. And it is important because you know what? If we're giving somebody our word, we're representing the word. Amen. I mean, because I would imagine, I know for a fact that Rand on the job has already told people that he lives for Jesus. And so if I'm going to get over here and give my boss my word and I don't do what I say I'm going to do, then now I'm... I'm that's right. Oh, yeah. Everybody around him would be doing that. And he calls himself a Christian. Amen? But anyway, praise God. Now the, your word is backed up by the word. And so, you know what? We're accountable. I mean, I know that that isn't part of the lesson, but it's important for us to remember we're accountable. He goes through it. I mean, look, the Lord showed me this a long time ago. I think, I think, I don't know if Aaron would remember, but I think the Lord showed, was talking to me about this way back when, you know, that the, the people in the church, we talk so much about accountability and we talk so much about being accountable to one another. And I think that that is so important that, that another Christian can trust another Christian. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's important because how many times do Christians in the church hurt you? You'll get hurt worse in the church than you will in the world. But the point that you know the Lord was showing me was that, Matt, you can't be accountable to nobody until you learn how to be accountable to me. Because let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit, if you give Him leeway, those little deep, dark crevices of your life, deep in your heart, that only you and He knows about, if you'll give Him access, come on, if you'll give Him access and let Him begin to move in those areas and to begin to change those areas of your life, it'll be so easy for you to be accountable to other Christian brothers. It'll be so easy for you to be accountable accountable to your daddy. It'll be so easy for us to be accountable to someone else because we're being learning how to be accountable to the Lord. And guess what? You're not being accountable in and of your own strength. It's not like God said, you got to do this and live and I'm not going to help you. No. He sent His Son. He had a plan. He made access to you to have a way to the Holy Spirit, which is your strength and your power source, to give you what it is that you need to be accountable. Amen? All right. The last two verses that we're going to talk about was, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That's verse 4. Uh, John chapter 1. We're back at John chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 4 and 5. In Him was... Well, let's just start off with, with verse 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. You know, the main thing that jumped out at me at this verse was that God, Jesus... I, I erased it, but... Jesus connects God to man. Jesus contains within Himself the life of God. Jesus is, when Jesus' life shows up on the scene, everything brightens up. The light has shown up. You see what I'm saying? What does it say? It says that in Him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness. You see, you got to, you, and you and I should already understand this because of all the things that we've already discussed, but we talked about it in the beginning and let us remind ourselves that separate from God, which means separate from Christ, because there's not many ways to the Father, amen? Separate from Christ, men are walking in darkness. Their vision is obscured. There is no light for their pathway. That's why uh, David in Psalm 119 said, let your, uh, let your light be a lamp or something to that 
that effect for my, you know, for my feet. I need to be able to see where I'm going. When I'm in covenant with God and I have access to His Word and I have access to the Spirit of God, He wants to lead me and guide me down the right path. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to me and tell me the right thing. Let me tell you a story. I didn't, I don't know where this came from. But when I was a new Christian, I worked in the oil field. I, I did some kind of dangerous work. It, my, I brought my daughter here tonight. Well, you know what? It just is what it is. I brought... I went to Holland. And let me tell you something. I sat on that airplane in business class and I could have drank all the alcohol I would have wanted to drink because it was all paid for. But I didn't. And through gritting of teeth and speaking of law... I informed everyone that now I'm a Christian and I don't drink. And I have to tell you that I didn't feel comfortable about it because I wasn't truly walking in victory. I did not understand that God was my source of victory. You understand what I'm saying? I knew what I was supposed to do, but I wasn't finding the strength that I needed to do it. But yet I was gritting my teeth and I said, I'm not going to drink. Well, we land in Holland, and I don't know if you know anything about Holland, but over there, prostitution's legal, hash is legal, marijuana's legal, everything's legal. Heroin. <laughs> Even, I don't know if heroin's legal, it may be now. I know the needles, they give the needles out on the street because they don't want people... Yeah. And so, all this stuff is legal. And let me tell you, tell you I don't know that I'll tell you the whole story, but I got on this bus... Because you, this, was, this was my thinking. They were going downtown, and we had just gotten to Holland, and I wanted to see some sights. You know what I'm saying? I literally, I just went the whole way on the airplane not drinking. I had no intentions of doing what these boys were planning on doing. But I'm thinking to myself that I'll get on the bus, and they'll go their way, and I'll go my way. I got my camera, and I'll take some pictures, and I'm going to check out Holland. And when I got on the bus, guess what I heard? As clear as the as, as day, without a cloud, and the sun shining in the sky, I heard a voice speak to my heart. And what it said was, get off the bus. <laughs> but do you think I listened? Like a ox being led to slaughter, I went on the bus and I sat down on the seat like some type of a, I don't know what. And I'm not even going to tell you the process that took place. It could, it could have got a lot worse. Okay, it could have been worse. But I indulged in some things that I really wish that I would not have indulged in. Thank God I didn't indulge in prostitution, I'll tell you that much. Okay? That doesn't mean that, that, you know, whatever the case. But since my daughter's here, I'll keep that one out of her mind. Okay? But every other thing that was available to me, basically. Let me tell you something. You go into the ballrooms over there, and they got these dudes, they're rolling marijuana and smoking it like cigarettes. And you know, and so you know, in America, if somebody was near someone that was smoking marijuana, they'd say, "Hey, dude, pass me the stuff." You know, and so if an American over there would say such a thing, not that an American would say such a thing, they look at you like you're retarded. They have photo albums full of all the various types of marijuana, whether it be red bud or tie stick. You know, not that I'm trying to go on and on about the devil and his kingdom of darkness. All kind of various photo albums of different types of hash that you can buy, and so to basically to, to make a long story short, I got dropped off in the middle of this mosh pit of sin, okay, and all I had to do was listen to the voice. How many times does he speak to us? How many times does he try to warn us ahead of time? All the time. You know what I'm saying? I said that I said that story, hopefully that'll help somebody else here. I hope you know that you know what, just listen to the voice, man. And if you feel that thing pulling you, trying to pull you towards it, you know what? Cry out for grace. Lord, I need your help. Uh, I can't do it on my own, but I know that you purchased it for me. Amen? And so Jesus was the life of God, and He brought light into men. One of the things that I thought was interesting, and I thought of this earlier today, was that, and the light shines in the darkness. The Bible doesn't say that the darkness evaporated. The, the, the Bible doesn't say that darkness went away. As a matter of fact, we know that darkness still exists today. As a matter of fact, we know that now Jesus, who was the life of God and brought light to men, it brought the kingdom of God with Him, and now the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness coexist on the earth today. They coexist. Why is it that God would leave 
the kingdom of darkness intact. Why is it that would He would allow, or at least allow the kingdom of darkness to continue to exist? Because there's a choice. He's left a choice to be made. Okay, But one of the things I thought was interesting is, is that the light shines in the darkness. Jesus came right smack dab in the midst of the darkness. He came right down in the middle of the darkness. I don't know if Aaron would remember that. I'm sure he does. But one time, or like, I don't know, about eight years ago, there was this guy named Lance Rao. And he carries a, he carry a cross. He had real long hair and a beard. He just like crazy for Jesus, man. I'm talking about this dude is like sick for Jesus. You you probably if you ran into him, you might see June bugs or like locusts hanging out of his beard, and eating wild honey, man. I mean, but this dude is sold out, bro. I'm telling you, you can say whatever you want for him. You can you, you may not agree necessarily. I don't know with all this theology, but all I know is brother Hunt laid his life down for the God. Anyway, he invites Aaron and I to go with him to Bourbon Street to carry the cross and I'll never forget remember we, we got there and he parked and he blew that show far, far that was the first thing he poured some oil in there and sprayed oil up all up in the air and he was like okay soldiers or whatever he said let's go and he starts carrying that cross and the closer we started getting to Bourbon Street I could start feeling this boom 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 I could feel the bass of the music hitting you know boom that brother just walked right up in the mosh pit of that sin and slammed that cross right down in the middle of Bourbon Street and just stood there and started talking about Jesus. And just, man, look, I'm telling you, brother, it just completely changed the whole atmosphere. Completely changed. Oh, there was a lot of ridicule that night. There was a lot of joking, but there were a lot of people that stopped and told him, Thank you, man. I gave my heart to the Lord five years ago and I've been a backslidden Christian. Thank you, man. There was a lot of people that got angry. There was a lot of people that... But, but the, yeah. Why are you doing this, man? You're not supposed to be doing this. Yeah, you don't want me doing this because you're convicted. Because you're supposed to be living for Jesus and you didn't know some fool was going to show up over here with a cross to remind you that your Savior died on the cross to set you free from your sin and now you're all up in the middle of it. You didn't know that was going to happen. That's why you're mad. But, but what I was thinking of whenever I read the Scripture is the fact that Lance just dropped that cross right in the middle of that that darkness. Bam! Here it is, boys. What you going to do with it? And that's what Jesus did. Jesus just came right down in the midst of it. Bam! Here it is. The life of God. Connecting God to man. Bringing light to men. And, and you know what? And dwelt in the middle of it. Jesus wasn't scared of it. He wasn't scared to get His hands dirty. Now, I'm not telling you, don't get on the bus. Whatever you do, don't get on the bus. If you get on the bus, get off the bus. Okay? But what I'm telling you is don't be scared to help people just because they don't, they aren't as far, far along with the Lord as you are. Amen? The last thing that I wanted to point out was is that in the darkness comprehended it not and that many scholars say that a better translation, really the word in the Greek means apprehended it not. It means that the darkness was not able to overcome the light. It means, amen, hallelujah. The, even though the light showed up smack dab in the midst of the darkness, amen, the darkness was not able to overcome the light. The light prevailed, hallelujah. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst men, amen. He spoke the word of God. He spoke the plan of God. And he enacted the plan of God because he lived his life perfect. Darkness could not tempt him to the point of succumbing to the enemy's vices. Darkness could not talk him out of, amen, God's plan. He said, not my will, but your will be done, Father. And then he went to the cross, amen, and he offered up his life as a perfect sacrifice, hallelujah, to pay the penalty for your sin so that when you put your faith in that, you're no longer guilty. You're not guilty. I got to tell you something tonight. I don't care what the devil's been telling you. I don't care what he's, how, what kind of lies he's been saying to you. I don't even care what you did with him last night. Come on. Because what I'm trying to tell you is this. Is that your innocence is not based off of what you did. Amen. Your innocence is based off of what he did. And you got a new position. And your position is that you are in Christ, and when the eyes of the Father look down upon you, they no longer see your guilt. They no longer see your faults. They no longer see your sin. They see the goodness and the purity and the perfection of Christ. And if you can learn to believe that, if you can learn to see, I don't want you to believe it because I said it, 
I want you to learn to believe it because He wrote it. Because He did it. Amen. Because He communicated it to you. That you're righteous and you're innocent because that was the plan. That was the plan from the beginning. To redeem you. To buy you off of the slave market. See? And when this takes place, something changes on the inside. He changes your name. He changes your name to Theophorus. Amen? One who bears God in His breast. Amen? That's what I want my name changed to. I want my name changed to one who bears God in His breast. Amen? Father, we come to You in prayer tonight, Lord. We thank You for Your precious Word. I thank You for every each and every person here tonight, Lord. We ask, Lord, that Your Holy Spirit would make Your Word real to us, Lord. We ask that Your Holy Spirit, Lord, would change us on the inside. Lord, we need Your help. We need your help as we travel this pathway called life, Lord God, in the midst of darkness. Lord, darkness surrounds us on every side, but you have come to give us life and life more abundantly, and you have come to allow the light of God to shine in us and through us, Lord. That's what you said, Lord God, in Matthew chapter 5. You said that we were the light of the world, that we were the salt of the earth. Lord God, I pray that our lights would burn brightly, Lord God, and that we would be a reflection of you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.